there buckled in and screaming toward the general election in November. Now that it is unofficially official that President Biden and former President Trump will go head to head again. Nikki Haley today bowing out. So what happens next in this new phase of the campaign? And we'll talk about why the prospect of a debate matchup is suddenly on the table. Also new tonight, some breaking news out of the Middle East. Two sailors killed by Houthi rebels. The first deaths near the Red Sea since the Israel-Hamas war started. But the Pentagon's saying when we take you there live. Then new concerns about a potential civil war in Haiti. Why the State Department wants the country's prime minister to hurry up and step down ASAP. Plus a new plan by the TSA to get you through the airport faster with security that's kind of like self-checkout. But the question of speed versus security is coming up. We'll get into it. And in tonight's original, how some Silicon Valley investors want to revive nuclear power plants to fuel the AI revolution. What does that mean? We're getting into that a little bit later on in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and tonight the longest general election in a generation begins with Donald Trump, now the presumptive Republican nominee, setting up a rematch with President Biden. We haven't had the major candidates locked down this early since MySpace hit a million users back in 2004. That means we're going to tie the record that year, 244 days till the general election. And after 243 of them, you will not be able to avoid the moment that polls show most Americans have been dreading, an election day featuring Donald Trump versus Joe Biden. More than half of voters saying they don't want either as their nominee. Two thirds say they want somebody new. They are not getting it this time. We're at this point after Nikki Haley today decided her time is up after she won just one state on Super Tuesday. And as she drops out of the race, she's tossing a challenge Mr. Trump's way. Watch. It is now up to Donald Trump to earn the votes of those in our party and beyond it who did not support him. And I hope he does that. At its best, politics is about bringing people into your cause, not turning them away. For his part, the former president mocking Haley, even as he invites her supporters to get behind him. A directive, if you will, to fall in line as the last holdouts in his party are doing just that, including a formerly reluctant Mitch McConnell, who summed up his endorsement of Mr. Trump today by gushing exuberantly that Mr. Trump has the, I'm quoting here, requisite support of Republican voters. Okay, maybe not exuberance so much as perhaps resignation to the reality here that this is Donald Trump's party. But on the Democratic side, you've got President Biden hoping he can peel away some of the Haley supporters who feel there's just not a place for them in the MAGA movement. So the big question we have, where are those voters going to go? Exit polls in a couple of key states show a chunk of Nikki Haley voters not promising to back Donald Trump. Does that mean they're going to go for President Biden or does it mean they're going to stay home? We'll get the view from Haley World with Ali Vitale in just a second. But I want to start with Garrett Hake, steps away from Mar-a-Lago in West Palm Beach, Florida. So, Garrett, you got the former president saying, right, that he wants the party to unify behind him. But when you pull up some of the exit polling here, about 60 percent of voters in these three key states say that they just don't feel part of the MAGA movement. He's got to bring them in somewhere. And this is something that I know you've been talking about with, with folks on your orbit as well. Yeah, that's right, Hallie. And I think you characterized it correctly, that he wants the party to unify, but he wants it to happen on his terms. Now, Donald Trump has made no effort to reach out or to somehow temper his style or change his policy positions in such a way as to appeal to that section of the Republican Party who hasn't supported him. To the degree that he has made this a focal point at all, he's done it almost entirely through the lens of, you know, say, allowing Joe Biden to essentially push soft Republicans back into his orbit. I asked him about this all the way back during the New Hampshire primary, and here's what he told me then. It's still operable now. How do you bring them back into the team? They're going to all vote for me again. They're going to all vote for me again, everybody. And I'm not sure we need too many. I, I'm not sure. I think that Biden is the worst president in the history of this country. But we're going to all come back. They're all coming back. And I think you see that here. Jumping ahead to March, two things I think are still true. Number one, the Trump campaign believes that, again, the Biden part of this will work to their advantage, that he will push voters back into Donald Trump's camp. The other part of this, Hallie, is they just don't think this is as big of a problem as uh, as the data that you just showed might indicate. They look at swing state polls that still show Donald Trump, in many cases, comfortably ahead of Joe Biden and think that perhaps they don't need as many of these Nikki Haley voters back as you or I might believe.
Yeah, I mean, potentially a risky bet. We'll see. You've also got, as we talk about the general election, right, 244 days away, uh, one of the things that is a hallmark of the fall pre-election is typically debates between the two candidates. In the last couple of hours, and this has been an open question since Donald Trump didn't do any of the primary debates, sounds like maybe he'd do one with President Biden. Talk us through it. Yeah, not just maybe, according to this Truth Social post, he's ready, he says, to do debates anytime, anywhere, tomorrow. any place, including, uh, including tomorrow, including on MSNBC, <laughs> including perhaps hosted by the Commission on Presidential Debates, which ironically, the Republican Party voted to boycott back in mm. 2022 at Donald Trump's direction. It just shows you the way that the political winds have changed here. The Trump campaign and Donald Trump feels like one on one against Joe Biden he puts on the better showing and that they can backfoot the president who has not committed to participating in any debates by suggesting they should do this now, do it often. They may be believing their own hype too much here. I suppose we might ultimately find out whether or not they think uh, the president will be a weaker debater than Donald Trump. Although I will say historically, Hallie, uh, incumbent presidents almost always stumble in that first debate. So it may be a pretty a good tactical risk here by Donald Trump to kind of force this issue now. Garrett Haig, watching all of it there from your perch near Palm Beach. Garrett, thank you. Ali Vitale is also perched in Charleston, South Carolina, perhaps for the last night, Ali, after months of following Nikki Haley on the <laughs> campaign trail. What's been interesting has been this question, what her tone would be. You and I were together when we were on that special report earlier. She was making mm -hmm. that announcement. She didn't like, I mean, she congratulated Donald Trump. Uh, she talked about being a conservative Republican. What she didn't say was, hey, everybody who supported me, go out and support the former president. She kind of encouraged people to make up their own minds about it. And it seems like she's still kind of making up hers, Hallie, because mm -hmm. what the other half of that sentence was when she said, I'm a conservative Republican, the next thing she says was, I always back the party's nominee. And then she didn't back the party's nominee. This might be a clue as to why, though, this list of policy things that she has different with Donald Trump. Watch. A smaller federal government is not only necessary for our freedom, it is necessary for our survival. Term limits for Washington politicians are needed now more than ever. Standing by our allies in Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan is a moral imperative. It's that last one, Hallie, that I think is so important. The way that Nikki Haley has really stood in the breach from a foreign policy perspective, even as a lot of folks within her own Republican Party are trying to back away from continued aid to allies like Ukraine, uh, pumping the brakes in Congress on aid to Israel because it's tied up in a whole bunch of other thorny politics issues. The fact that Haley has been clear-eyed and consistent there makes her very different than the former president and her former boss, who has not had much to say, if anything, negative about Vladimir Putin, even in the wake of the murder of one of his political dissidents and the top pol uh, top uh, political critic there in Russia, Alexei Navalny, just weeks ago. For yeah. Haley, those are key differences, and they might explain the lack of endorsement, too. One of the questions, Ali, and we laid this out right at the beginning of the show here, what happens? <clears throat> Listen, Nikki Haley is not getting a majority of the Republican electorate. We've seen that. She couldn't. That's why she's not in the race anymore. She didn't get zero, right? It wasn't much, but there were certainly some sliver of the Republican Party who backed her. And even though we talked about Garrett saying there's, there's an open question as to how much the Trump campaign feels like they need to extend any olive branches to that slice, we know that if this is a, you know, any similarities to 2020, it's going to be close. It's going to be, like, super close. The margins are yeah. super tight, which is why some of these, in particular, suburban women in these key swing states matter, the very folks who seemed to favor Nikki Haley in some of these early primaries. Let me play a little bit of what some of these voters told you, our team, others. Watch. That's a really good question. I would, I, it's probably going to be Biden. I'm a little concerned with Trump, but at the same time, uh, if it's between Trump and Biden, then it's, uh, I'd probably vote for Trump. Divided, but also reluctant, which speaks to the idea that the other challenger here in a Donald Trump, Joe Biden setup is voter apathy, Allie. What if they stay home? 
And frankly, I've heard from those voters who loathe having to make this choice and also say, maybe I just don't make it. Maybe I vote down ballot. Maybe I just stay home, period. And when you look at states like Wisconsin or Michigan or especially Georgia, which Biden was able to flip, we know that these are states that turn on tens of thousands of ballots. That is not a lot of ballots. And so for people to say they're staying home, that would certainly impact the turnout question and could impact the way that these states go. It could also be impacted if you're Trump and you're losing votes from would-be Republicans, that could be enough to help Biden. Both parties are sort of fighting this apathy question right now, and Haley's supporters are front of that pack. Ali Vitale, live for us there in South Carolina. Where do you go next, friend? Do you know yet? To my bed, to sleep. <laughs> Enjoy. You deserve it. Thank you, Ali. Thank Appreciate you. all your coverage, and thanks to your team as well. Let's take you to the other side of the aisle now from the Republican presumptive candidate to the Democratic one, or nominee, we should say, with President Biden getting ready to make what's basically a response to Mr. Trump's Super Tuesday near sweep tomorrow night at the State of the Union. Big platform for the president. Look at this graphic. Okay, these are all the, this is the top 100 live broadcasts last year. See all those footballs? It was like all sports, almost, except for three things. The Oscars, the Thanksgiving Day Parade, you see it there. And you see that little icon there, the State of the Union, that little flag on the 21st? It's a big deal, right? There's a lot of eyeballs on this. And for President Biden, our team's reporting that a lot of his message will boil down to whose side are you on? Expect to hear a lot about the cost of drugs, immigration and the border, the Israel-Hamas war. All of it, part of what the president sees, not as a one-night primetime event, but something that leads up to a full-on flood-the-zone moment for his message. Kelly O'Donnell is outside the White House for us. And Kelly, this is an opportunity for the president in front of these many eyeballs, as we laid out, perhaps push back to one of the big voter concerns about him coming into November, which is his age, his fitness for office here. I'm interested to see how he might respond, a la last year, to any heckling from the room. I know you and the team have some new reporting on that and a whole bunch of other uh, nuggets leading up to tomorrow night. Talk us through it. Well, certainly, Hallie, when the president knows he's in front of a room, which includes hundreds of members of Congress, and we know that sort of the decorum in the chamber has uh, loosened up, uh, to put it uh, politely, over the years. So it could be members of Congress who could heckle. It could be those who are attending in the gallery. There are guests of each member of Congress and senators uh, who are invited to witness this extraordinary event of seeing a State of the Union in person. And so there might be on either the far right or the far left on issues as wide ranging as uh, the ceasefire demands in Gaza to immigration and the border, you could see heckling. And so clearly the president, as part of his preparation with a small group of senior advisors spending time at Camp David, working through iterations of the draft. And part of it is anticipating what might be said, what might come up, and then how best to try to respond to that. In many ways, the Biden administration, the team around the president, would sort of welcome one of those moments because they felt that what happened last year with some uh, calling out related to Social Security gave the president a moment to show command of the room to almost negotiate in real time with Republicans uh, to agree to no cuts on Social Security and have a bit of a win in that moment by perception, by demonstrating his agility and those kinds of things. So there is opportunity along with peril when it comes mm. to preparing for hecklers. So I have like 90 million more questions for you and not 90 million more minutes, Kelly, but let me tick through a couple of them because we sure. know on policy, right, there's a lot of interesting topics here. Republicans have made immigration front and center in their 2024 push. What's interesting, talking to, to the Biden campaign, they also want to flip the script on immigration and try to get Republicans back on their heels after Congress failed to pass any meaningful immigration reform. They expect to hear that, that the president will push back to say that the necessary steps for immigration and border security require funding, and that can only be done by Congress to pay for the Border Patrol agents, to pay for uh, more judges for asylum courts and so forth. So he's going to say he's exhausted executive authority. They don't plan to unveil any new unilateral steps. It's Congress who has to pass the money and the policy to get it done. And then, Kelly, just very quickly, we talked about former President Trump, this idea that he may want to debate President Biden, this idea that he's going to be, like, watching in real time tomorrow night. Team Biden seems to be like, hey, bring it on. If you're so thirsty, just do it. Talk us through that. 
Well, they recognize that sometimes these in-the-moment moments can be very helpful. They're also risky. There are high stakes. But they want to draw out the former president. They want to set up this contest as the divide that has unfolded now of a rematch election in a new moment, where they believe they can argue that Joe Biden, even if you don't agree on all of his policies, is still the, the sounder choice, the better choice. And so they believe that Tangling with the former president will reveal more of what makes especially elusive voters unsettled about him. Hallie? Kelly O'Donnell, zippity zipping through it all in front of the White House for us tonight. <laughs> Kel, thank you. Let's take you to the Middle East now because we have some developing news out of there where we're learning that Houthi rebels in Yemen have killed at least two sailors in a missile attack on a commercial ship today. The first time anyone's been killed in the rebel group's attacks since they started targeting ships in the Red Sea at the start of the Israel-Hamas war. It happened on a Liberian-owned ship flying the Barbados flag, raising the possibility now that American troops could respond with yet another round of strikes on the rebels. NBC's Courtney QB is following this one for us. Okay, so Court, the big question, what could the response be now that lives have been lost for the first time in this situation, in this conflict? Yeah, so we've seen a series of escalating responses, frankly, from the first time that the U.S. and the British military actually um, came together and conducted a round of airstrikes inside Yemen. We saw another round of those just recently. And U.S. officials here at the Pentagon are saying, yes, they are looking at options for a response. But the reality is, Hallie, there's also a growing frustration about the fact that this continuing these, these airstrikes, including the ones that are occurring on a near daily basis, these so-called dynamic or self-defense defense strikes that the U.S. military is taking just about every day, they don't seem to be deterring the Houthis. We've seen just in the past two days five Houthi missile attacks against ships. The one that we're seeing that we're talking about here today that killed two civilian mariners and wounded six others, they actually struck another ship that didn't really do any fatalities, but there were three other missiles that were, that were targeting ships in the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden. So the Houthis do not seem to be deterred. And it's not just here at the Pentagon that they're talking about the possibility of another response here. We heard from the State Department spokesperson about how the U.S. is considering response. Here's what he said. The United States will continue to hold the Houthis accountable for their attacks. We have always made clear that um, this is going to be a long-term process both to deter the Houthi attacks and to degrade their capabilities to, to carry them out. And what Matt Miller just said there about degrading their capabilities, that's one of the big challenges here, Hallie, is the U.S. doesn't have a really good sense of exactly what the Houthis have in their arsenal. Remember, before November, the U.S. wasn't really taking, paying a whole lot of attention to the Houthis. They were not conducting these sorts of attacks against the maritime environment. Now the U.S. doesn't have a really strong baseline of what all they have in their arsenal. That just makes us all the more challenging. Courtney QB navigating all of it there live for us at the Pentagon Court. Thank you. Down south right now, Alabama lawmakers are working to get a bill on the governor's desk by the end of the day to get state IVF clinics open again. You're about to be looking live at the legislative sessions that just started the Senate in the last hour at the State House in just the last 20 minutes. Now, this bill would protect fertility clinics from lawsuits. That's after that controversial ruling by the Alabama Supreme Court that frozen embryos have the same rights as children. Still, some lawyers say the bill, as written, just doesn't do enough. Dasha Burns is covering this one live for us from Montgomery, Alabama tonight. Explain that piece of it, Dasha, what the bill does and does not do, and what you're hearing from folks on the ground. Yeah, Hallie, so the bill is being debated on the House floor right now as we speak. What this bill does do is protect clinics and the providers, all, basically all the folks involved in IVF treatment from legal uh, liability, criminal and civil liability. And that means that if this bill passes uh, tonight or, or tomorrow, that clinics will be able to reopen. Remember, there are families that have been in the lurch for weeks now when this, uh, as after this decision came out. And I've been talking to lawmakers here. Uh, Democratic lawmakers are concerned about this bill. They're willing to vote for it, but they're not in full-throated support. Take a listen. I will support this bill because I feel like our families here need to have immediate relief, but it's like putting a Band-Aid on a hemorrhaging wound. It's not addressing the issue of um, the, the fundamental issue that uh, an embryo is not, is not a child. 
And that's the fundamental question here is, will this bill be enough, given that the uh, ruling and the state's constitution still has uh, this clause in it saying that embryos are people? Howie. Dasha Burns, live for us there in Montgomery. Dasha, thank you so much. Tonight, officials are sharing more about the victim of that huge fire in Michigan, the one that you're about to see on screen. I want to show you here the explosions coming out of this plant, literally shaking houses nearby. Do you see that? Horrific. Raining down debris on Monday. Police say this was all happening at a vape distribution facility that had been illegally storing combustible gas canisters one of which apparently hit 19-year-old Turner Salter, eventually killing him. Officials say Salter was at a nearby car wash, maybe watching all of this, all the commotion as it happened. Now, crews are there at the scene. You can see some of the aftermath here cleaning up as officials warn that some of the debris scattered around could still be dangerous, could still potentially be explosive. So the big question they're trying to answer, what came first at this plant? Was it the fire or was it the explosion? Adrian Bradas is joining us now. We've shown the pictures. And you can't overstate it, how dramatic this was. Some of these explosive canisters went flying something like a mile. It is still dangerous near this site. Talk to us about what happened and where the investigation goes now. Hallie, the latest information is up to two miles away. That's how far the debris was scattered. And the warning for residents here is if you see one of those canisters, don't touch it, don't pick it up, because it could still explode. We have seen small fires reemerging here throughout the day. Investigators are hoping that they can get on this site fully so they can start the next step to pinpoint what happened, what led to that series of explosions. You talked about those flying canisters and the flying debris. That is what hit the 19-year-old Turner in his head. His funeral is planned for this Friday. He will be remembered as a teen who was kind and served in his church. Meanwhile, people back here in the community are still talking about what they saw. What I felt was the whole world, the earth shaking. It was, uh, it was, it was, pr it was pretty bad and scary. Um, it never stopped. It never stopped. The explosions never stopped. And what was exploding, Hallie? Those canisters, which contained butane, at least half remained after the business owners here had just received recently a shipment, a semi load. Also inside of a back room, according to city officials, was a pallet of nitrous oxide along with lighter fluid. And authorities telling us this, well, it's gone now, but the building that was here before was supposed to be a retail operation. Allie? Adrian brought us live for us there in Michigan. Thank you. Out of New Mexico tonight, jurors are now deliberating the Rust shooting case after prosecutors told them that when the movie set's armorer wasn't doing her job, filming was a game of Russian roulette every time an actor had a gun. Listen. I'm not telling you that Hannah Gutierrez intended to bring live rounds on set. I'm telling you that she was negligent. She was careless. She was thoughtless. It's been a dramatic trial. It's been an emotional trial, as we are now officially on verdict watch tonight, centered around the woman you see here, Hannah Gutierrez-Reed. This is her in court today. She was the one who loaded the gun that went off in Alec Baldwin's hand on October 21st, 2021, which led to the death of the movie's cinematographer, Helena Hutchins. Now it's up to the jury to decide if Gutierrez-Reed was to blame here for not being more careful. If they find her guilty of involuntary manslaughter, of tampering with evidence, she could face years in prison. Dana Griffin is covering this for us now from Santa Fe, New Mexico. We talked about the prosecution's closing arguments. The defense's closing arguments drilled down on the fact that the jury has to be sure that Gutierrez-Reed was responsible beyond a reasonable doubt. How did they thread that needle? Yeah, Hallie, so the defense pointed to the fact that the prosecutor has yet to find or show any direct evidence of how and when those live rounds found their way on set. They blamed actor Alec Baldwin for pulling the trigger, stating that the scene, that script specifically, did not call for him to draw his weapon. They blamed the, the supplier of that ammo and also the investigators for not doing a search warrant until a month after the shooting. They say the supplier could have thrown away evidence. And they have also cited multiple times that OSHA report that found fault with the production, Rust Productions, and management for several safety failures throughout that entire filming session. 
Listen. The buck stops with production. As in any organization, it starts at the top. You've got a convenient fall person. You've got a convenient scapegoat. And she may not be the armor on some days. She's a props person, but she's certainly the armor when everything goes bad. Now, the prosecution added that she was not the fall person. She was the person who did not do her job. She also agreed. You're right. Hannah Gutierrez Reed did not know that she was loading a live round because the prosecutor says had she known, she would have been charged with murder. Hallie. What is the timeline now? What is the expectation for how quickly we may see some kind of a verdict here from the jury? I know that that is all tea leaf reading, Dana, but what's your sense? Mm hmm. We, Hallie, could literally have a verdict by today. I want to let wow. you know, we just got word that the jury has a question, so not a verdict, but they have called counsel back in. Our producer has gone in to try to listen in, so maybe we can update you next hour on maybe what that question was and maybe get a sense of how close they are to coming to a verdict. Yeah, Hallie? that's super interesting. Dana Griffin, thank you for being there. We'll look for that update from you next hour. Appreciate it. Lots more to get to coming up this hour as well, including the new backlash against Doritos that is giving Bud Light boycott. We'll explain. Plus, why this mega yacht seized from a Russian oligarch is costing American taxpayers like a million dollars a month. Elon Musk tonight putting to bed some questions about who he's supporting in the 2024 election. And it looks like it's nobody, at least when it comes to dollars. In a post today on his platform X, Musk wrote, just to be super clear, I am not donating money to either candidate for U.S. president. And look, he kind of had to come out and say this after he was spotted at Mar-a-Lago this past weekend, meeting with Mr. Trump and a few Republican donors, according to The New York Times. The whole thing raised a bunch of questions about whether Musk might be putting his support and perhaps some of his nearly $200 billion net worth behind the former president, who is very much looking for cash. NBC News business and data correspondent Brian Chung is joining us now with more. So even if Musk doesn't make any direct donations, and by the way, the language is interesting in his, in his ex post. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Like, there's also a lot of things that aren't campaigns you can donate money to. You know what I mean? That would, that would make it different here. Still, he's got a lot of ways, if he wanted to, to put his finger on the scale come November. Yeah, well, and it's significant because he's one of the wealthiest people in the world. But yeah, I mean, if he says he's not going to commit money, there are certainly other ways that he could put his thumb on the scale. And that's because of his massive influence, right? He owns the X, formerly known as Twitter platform. He's got 175 million followers on there. And then even outside of the public facing aspect of what Musk does and says, it's also behind the scenes, right? He has many connections to other very wealthy people. And again, this is just one example, but we know that he has a relationship with Kanye West, who also has a lot of money. So money could go into to the Trump campaign as a result of his connections, even if it doesn't come from Musk directly. But also, again, he's been tweeting very clearly. It's not a surprise to anyone that he supports uh, this, this candidate over uh, Biden. And for that reason, he can continue to say things in some cases, also lob perhaps misinformation about hmm. certain situations, as he's done before, to perhaps uh, put his thumb on the scale, Hallie. A recent NBC News investigation found that Musk is wrapped up in at least 11 different regulatory battles with the government. He is, in some ways, Brian, unique uniquely invested in who ends up in the White House. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, he runs many, many businesses. A lot of them have been wrapped up in regulatory issues, which he has been, uh, Musk rather, has been very clear in saying holds him back. So he might be in favor of a candidate that is going to pair some of those regulations back as uh, Trump did during 2016. But I also want to point out that Musk isn't necessarily on board entirely with all the policies. We remember that deal book uh, conference that he appeared at earlier this year where he didn't necessarily go full throated behind Trump. Take a listen. Could you see yourself voting for President Biden? If, if, it's, if it's a Biden-Trump election, for example? I think I would not vote for Biden. <laughs> You'd vote for Trump? I'm not saying I'd vote for Trump, but I mean, this is, this is definitely a difficult choice here. So a difficult choice here. I mean, look, we've known based off of what he said since then that he would support Trump over Biden. But you have to see that. I mean, that long pause was a long pause. Right. So when it comes to the other types of policies, that certainly does enter the fold here. But on a regulatory basis, certainly he would probably prefer uh, the former president to uh, to Biden. 30,000 foot view here, though. X could be incredibly powerful 
come November uh, in ways that are perhaps useful to candidates and to campaigns and in ways that are perhaps dangerous when it comes to something you alluded to, which is misinformation. Yeah, and, and we have to remember that he has used this platform for political reasons before when he tried to launch the Ron DeSantis campaign. Remember, that didn't go well at all. There were technical issues behind the scenes. But, you know, even if Musk isn't throwing money behind the scenes, we have to remember that this platform has had a lot of big changes since he took it private not long ago. And there are concerns about whether or not even if he himself is going to, uh, you know, use it to say whatever he wants to say, that whether or not he's going to police the other types of misinformation that could come for the other millions of users that are on the platform. So, Here's the stance when it comes to X's policy on specifically voting and civic engagement. So it says, quote, you may not use X's services for the purposes of manipulating or interfering in elections or other civic processes. I'm paraphrasing here, but that includes a suppressing participation, misleading people about how and where to vote or inciting violence during an election. So these are all things that are codified in the policy, but enforcing it, Hallie, is a whole separate question. It's a private company. There are no shareholders yeah. to answer to. That's very much an opaque process for uh, this massive social media company. Yeah, Musk is really uh, in the driver's seat on that one to a big yeah. degree. Brian Chung, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, prosecutors dropping charges today in the middle of that Hotel California trial we told you about. That means the charges are basically gone. This is the trial about whether lyrics to Hotel California and some other Eagles hits were stolen. It's after the defense said some newly available emails raised questions about the trial's fairness. The defendants, three collectibles experts, had pleaded not guilty. Number two, the government wants to sell this mega yacht that it seized from a Russian oligarch a couple years ago when it was trying to pressure Russia to back off Ukraine. The yacht costs the government a million dollars a month just to maintain. It's a lot of money, according to new court filings. The government says it is done with what it calls the excessive costs of maintenance and crew. It's expensive to keep a mega yacht. Number three, Starbucks Middle East franchisee says it's laying off 2,000 people because business is tough. They say some customers have boycotted the chain since the start of the Israel-Hamas war over what they think is its political stance. Starbucks says they do not have a political agenda. Number four, Target is rolling out a paid membership program. It's kind of like Amazon Prime. This one's called Target Circle 360. It'll cost you 99 bucks a year. And basically, it's free same-day delivery for orders over $35, delivered in as little as an hour, plus free two-day shipping. Launches in April. Number five, take a look at this. A rare gray whale spotted near Nantucket. And if you think, oh, that's pretty cool, do you know what researchers think? Their heads exploded. They couldn't even take it. One of them said my brain was trying to process what I was seeing because these whales have been extinct from the Atlantic for more than 200 years. Whaling, obviously the issue there. Now this one, this one whale is back, maybe because of climate change, with less sea ice in the whale's way as they make their way to that part of the Atlantic. Pretty cool. To some new right-wing brand backlash now after Doritos says it's cutting ties with a transgender influencer in Spain. You see her there, Samantha Hudson. She had posted a video promoting Doritos Spain that is now off her page. The partnership prompting the hashtag boycott Doritos to pop up all over right-wing circles on X, formerly known as Twitter. Hudson hasn't commented, but in a statement to NBC News, Doritos parent company PepsiCo says it ended the relationship because of controversial deleted tweets she made Adding, and you see it here, we strongly condemn words or actions that promotes violence or sexism of any kind. If some of this is starting to sound a little bit familiar to you, maybe because there's so many shades of that conservative backlash Bud Light faced for partnering with trans influencer Dylan Mulvaney. Remember Kid Rock shooting beer cans? It was everybody who watched the brand fall from its number one perch. Maura Barrett is following this one for us. So same, same, but different, right, as it relates to Doritos and Bud Light. Explain the controversy here. There is a lot of overlap, but I think it's important to break down the background of it all. Hudson is a 24-year-old artist and singer in Spain, and the post in question uh, appeared about a decade ago. I want to pull up some of the reporting that we have here at NBC for you. Hudson was reported to have tweeted back in 2015 about wanting to do, quote, depraved things with a 12-year-old girl. That's according to Rolling Stone. NBC News has not seen the original posts on social media, and they appear to have been removed from X. Now, Hudson later reportedly expressed remorse 
source for those tweets, but that post, which was made back in 2021, is no longer available on her page. And there is more. Others online pointed out that Hudson has been critical of the right wing in Spain. In an interview clip that resurfaced, she appears to say she advocates, quote, for the abolition to destroy and eliminate the traditional monogamous nuclear family. And that's according to a translation of the video from Spanish to English. And so obviously a lot of controversy swirling around those purported comments and Dorito laying out exactly how they found out and when they found out and kind of immediately distancing themselves from Hudson, all due to what they say is those specific comments. So not exactly the same uh, as the Bud Light controversy, but That's definitely right. some overlapping shades. Maura Barrett, thank you very much for that one. Appreciate it. Got a lot more to get to coming up here on the show, including chaos in Haiti, the prime minister off the island on American soil, and the new push from across the Caribbean for him to step aside. Plus, a different kind of showstopper hits Vegas, why the Bellagio had to pause its famous fountain show. Next. NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day, and because it can be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. Out of our Northeast Bureau, hundreds of National Guards members are being, de uh, National Guardsmen are being deployed to try to control the crime surge in New York City's subways. The move is part of the governor's five-point safety plan that also includes things like more surveillance cameras. That comes as the NYPD is being given the go-ahead to pick up bag checks. Out of our Western Bureau, the famous fountain show at the Bellagio in Las Vegas, you know that one? It's been paused thanks to a very rare bird. This yellow-billed loon spotted in the water outside of the hotel. Experts call it one of the 10 rarest birds that breeds on the U.S. mainland. Look at it. It's, it's giving duck vibes to me, but it's a loon, very rare. And there were concerns that the bird was going to get bothered by all the rushing water, by all the fountains going off. The Las Vegas Review Journal reports the loon has been safely relocated as of today. There you go. Out of our Midwest Bureau, Michigan dog to the rescue, a canine officer spotting a missing toddler in the woods just yards from a lake. Police say the three-year-old wandered off near his home Monday afternoon. After about an hour of searching, the canine led his handler toward the lake. Then he heard the boy crying. The toddler only had some small scrapes, and thankfully, look at that little babes. That little three-year-old's expected to be just fine, thank goodness. To Haiti now, where the U.S. tonight is urging the Haitian prime minister to speed up his own resignation and a political transition to democratic elections as the country gets close to the brink of civil war, according to one U.S. official and a source familiar with the conversations. In just the last few hours, we've heard from the State Department saying that they are not pushing. Listen. We are not calling on him or pushing for him to resign, but we are urging him to expedite the transition to an empowered and inclusive governance structure that will move with urgency to help the country prepare for a multinational security support mission to address the security situation and pave the way for free and fair elections. The administration's tiptoeing kind of carefully here. The important information and what you just heard from Matt Miller coming to the beginning, we're not pushing, we are encouraging, he said, because the security crisis in Haiti is hitting a breaking point. The prime minister, now in Puerto Rico, not able to fly back to Haiti because the airport there has been targeted, as we talked about earlier this week, right here on this show with our own Guad Venegas. It's Gabe Gutierrez picking up coverage now of Haiti because the U.S. is in the middle, Gabe, of this very, um, very delicate power struggle here. And I think you heard it a little bit when we played it from the State Department. Words matter in diplomacy. And in this instance, words definitely matter. Yeah, that's right, Hallie. And we just heard from Corinne Jean-Pierre a short time ago echoing what the State Department said, essentially that they are not pressuring uh, the prime minister to resign. They just want him to leave a little faster. So, yes, they are choosing their words very, very carefully here. Here's some of what Corinne Jean-Pierre, the White House press secretary, had to say. We are definitely not pushing prime, the prime minister to resign. That is not what we're doing. But we have underscored that now is the time to finalize a political accord to help set Haiti on a path to a better future. And that is something that we've been working on for some time. So, yeah, Hallie, the White House walking that very fine line. And as you said, this all comes as 
Prime Minister, um, the, the Prime Minister is now in Puerto Rico. The White House also saying that they are not helping the Prime Minister at this point. So unclear when he plans to return uh, to Haiti. Uh, Ariel Henry uh, came to power uh, back in 2021 following the assassination of the country's president. So this is the definite escalation, as you've reported, that over the weekend there was that prison break in that country. And this uh, Haiti is sliding further and further into chaos at this point, Hallie. Well, let's talk about that chaos, because we've talked about the issues with that airport getting targeted. It's an airport that I think it's the same one that you visited, Gabe, when you went to Haiti not too long ago. I think it was in the, within the last couple of years. The concern is, right, timing. If this security situation keeps getting worse, right, if, if these attacks keep on happening, um, the scope of what the White House, what the U.S. can do gets more and more narrow. Yeah, exactly. The options are, are limited here. Look, the U.S. has in some way, shape or another been involved with Haiti for a very long time. You know, even in the 90s, following Jean uh, the military coup, Jean Bertrand Aristide and the U.S. having to get involved there with a multinational force. And so now the question becomes, what options does the U.S. have? The, US, the White House has been very insistent that they will not send American boots on the ground to Haiti. But now this multi multinational security force force led by Kenya. When will that, uh, you know, t take effect? And what options does the U.S. have if the prime minister does not want uh, to, you know, g get out of power? So, yes, a lot of questions remaining at this point, Hallie. But the, but the, the major question right now for the U.S., how much does it plan to get involved? And, you know, when, when will these uh, gangs, these armed gangs in Haiti that now control about 70, uh, about 80 percent, actually, of Port-au-Prince, will they accept anything than the full resignation of the prime yeah. minister? Allie. Gabe Gutierrez, thank you so much for breaking that one down for us. Appreciate it. Coming up, a plan that could change the future of flying. How travelers are responding to a self-checkout style TSA checkpoint. So today, TSA is rolling out something that could change the future of checkpoints at the airport, a six-month plan that's kind of like self-checkout at the grocery store. It's only in Vegas for now, and it is only for people with pre-check for now, since, you know, we know the routine. NBC's Tom Costello knows the routine. He tried it for himself. Take a look. Come up to the checkpoint, take your carry-on, put it in the bin. If you've got any questions, simply ask the TSA officer on demand. Hi there, how may I help you today? Slide your bin onto the rollers, then walk right into the full body scanner. Put your arms down to the side, and it's going to look for anything that shouldn't be there. And it's telling me I got to come back out. I have a microphone, of course, that it's detected. I've got the transmitter on my belt, and something a lot of people forget my cell phone look at you what an active stand-up yeah. like you're doing it you're showing and telling because <laughs> what comes up for me is like you know you're at the grocery store doing self-checkout not you know 50 50 shot you don't make it through easily something goes wrong you gotta hit the little button the person says like is this actually gonna be helpful or like it, I, I, I'm a little skeptical. So, yes, and that's exactly what the TSA is trying to model from. Your okay. checkpoint experience, checkout experience at the local grocery store, whatever you use. Do you remember how to scan your bananas? I'm, I can I never remember the, the code. code. Exactly. What's the number, then it says error, then I can exactly. put it in the bag. And then I mean, there's like, your apples, you know, your shampoo, right. your chicken, like, whatever. Come on. Now, for those people who have it down pat, yes. the thinking is the same thing might be true in a TSA checkpoint. Hmm. If you are a pre-check you have to be pre-checked. Frequent flyer. And if you fly all the time and you know how to make this move, this may be something for you. You may be able to make this work. I asked the TSA chief, David Pekoski, Admiral David Pekoski, is this something that can roll out nationwide? Maybe not so fast. Mm -hmm. Here's what he said. Don't expect this to be widely rolled out at every airport and every checkpoint. No, I don't think so. And, and really, we're very early in the, in the process. I mean, you know, part of what we're trying to do here is to figure out, hey, what works? What facilitates movement of people? Uh, while at the same time, making sure that we can provide the security we provide. Two and a half million people, of course, are going through TSA checkpoints every day. And I got a little headline for you. If you are going on spring break, be warned. TSA says it's going to be even bigger than last year, which was a Oof. record. We're already seeing passenger volumes up 6% over last year. You know what they say, Tom? 
hack your patients. Have you Ooh. heard that one before? I don't know if you heard that. I'm the, that's I got a, a trademark that's underneath that. an H.J. original that. right there. Well, so here's the question, though, right? Because obviously the, the reason for TSA, the reason we go through these checkpoints, is not to annoy all of us and slow us down. It's for security. It's to keep us safe on the plane, right? So how do they navigate yeah. that? Do, do they think that this can actually create? Because we always see those images every year of, like, all the crazy things people leave at checkpoints that are confiscated. That's right. S safety versus speed? How are they navigating that? Listen, let's also underscore that it was stood up after 9-11 yes. and the tragedy tragedy of 9-11, and uh, they are still confiscating record numbers of guns every year at checkpoints. So that's the big question, right? Can this still achieve expedition? Can you move people through, but at the same time, can you have a secure checkpoint? Uh, there's also this going on here, I would tell you, and that is this concern about where we are in a competitiveness in terms of other countries and how well they screen passengers. Because the truth is, the U.S. Travel Association says we're number 17. Wow. Ranking number 17 in terms of our competitiveness. What do they base that on? Okay, among other things, how good is the airport? Are they kind of crumbling? Is that for all the airports broadly? Like that's an yeah. average of airports? Nationwide. Okay. okay. So, and you could see some of the other countries who had higher scores. Yeah. So, like, Reagan's pulling up that average. Maybe there's another airport pulling it down, you know. All right, did you like it? That was a little editorial on your did, part. That's fair. That's fine. <laughs> did travelers like it? Did people uh, talk I gotta to say, you? I think it's glitchy. Uh, I think it's a little right. glitchy. I think it may be too much to ask of Tom's passengers take. right now. Okay. All right. Well, we'll see. And I don't even, if you can't remember your banana code, <laughs> but if, it, if it's tested in Vegas, will it stay in Vegas? We'll see. Look at you with the turn of phrase, Tom Costello. Thank you. Appreciate right. you. Super interesting. Thank you. You bet. A lot more to come here on the show, including, and I have to tell you, literally, as Tom and I were talking, sounds like there is a verdict in the Rust trial that we talked about at the top of the show. We're getting Dana Griffin back to a camera. We're going to tell you in one second what that is. Just stay with us. We'll be right back after the break. So tonight's original now with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been watching. And tonight we're talking about nuclear power and AI. With those two words together for a lot of people, maybe feeling a little bit scary, right? Nukes and artificial intelligence. For others, it may bring back frightening memories of disasters like Chernobyl or Three Mile Island when we talk about nuclear plants. But a new generation of entrepreneurs out of Silicon Valley wants to build newer, safer plants that could power the future of AI. Here's Jake Ward. <laughs> This remote site in eastern Idaho could soon be the birthplace of a new nuclear age. The reprocessing and refabrication of highly radioactive fuel. The Idaho National Lab is a research facility where, in the 1970s and 80s, the U.S. government experimented with a safer kind of nuclear reactor. The federal government put their early research reactors out here because it's full of underground water and, frankly, there's no one out here. Decades after the plant stopped running, a Silicon Valley-backed company wants to build a new version, a 15-megawatt reactor called Aurora. We'll be installing a fuel fabrication line in here and making fuel for our, for our plant. The reactor will use liquid metal as coolant and leftover nuclear waste from the government as fuel. So this is the place where they will recover the fuel that you need. Yeah, and then we'll fabricate it. The company's CEO has been working in nuclear since he was 16 and envisions his reactor powering a town or a factory. For most of my life, there's not been a question about the demand for what nuclear energy is, which is reliable, clean, affordable. I mean, those are all attributes people want. And big tech wants it, too. Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates, and a host of VC firms have invested in several nuclear companies. There's a, a long history of humans and machines working together. OpenAI CEO Sam Altman is chairman of Oklo's board and speaks openly about requiring huge amounts of power for the data centers that make AI possible. This is like a desperate need for as much energy as we can manufacture. But this is not an unregulated technology like AI. This is nuclear, where the waste from even new reactor designs like Oklo's will remain dangerously radioactive for centuries. In 2022, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission told Oklo they had not provided enough safety information. DeWitt says the company is working to satisfy regulators. You've got new physics, you have to use new models, you have to do all sorts of stuff that's different than what they're used to. A lot of things that they're used to don't apply, but they have to do their independent job of ensuring this meets adequate safety requirements. In nearby Idaho yeah, Falls, folks seem pretty comfortable with the idea. I think it's great. We've had it before. Right. So at this point, you'd say you're pretty comfortable with nuclear power. Oh, yeah. 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 A growing number of Americans feel the same. But critics argue that nuclear solves a problem for tech CEOs, not for humanity. If you were to integrate large language models, GPT-style models into 
search engines. It's going to cost, you know, five times as much environmentally as standard search. I want to see innovation in this country. I just want the scope of innovation to be determined beyond, you know, the incentive structures of this these giant companies. Couldn't we just cut back on our energy consumption? Why do we need more to feed our society more and more and more power? Yeah, I'm going to answer that in two ways. We've almost always seen a direct correlation between energy abundance, in other words, high energy footprints, and pretty much all, all aspects of quality of life. Not to mention, we're also trying to decarbonize. We are still so far away from electrifying vehicles, and the amount of energy we're going to need to do that is huge. Now, Hallie, on the one hand, the question here is just logistical, right? I mean, if we're going to electrify everything from cars to kitchen ranges, we're going to need vastly more power than we can currently produce. But this also raises a philosophical question, right? I mean, whose interests are we serving by going to nuclear? Are we just serving the interests of companies that want to build AI products and EVs and figure out ways to power them? Or are we actually serving humanity's interests? I mean, are we, are we trying to live with more power or should we be trying to live with less? Hallie? It's these difficult uh, and really intense questions. Our thanks to our, our good friend Jake Ward for all of that amazing reporting. That does it for this hour. A reminder, we're going to have special coverage of the State of the Union tomorrow night right here on NBC News Now. You can find it however you're watching. I'll be rejoined by my friend Tom Yamas here in D.C. at 8 o'clock Eastern. And then on NBC News starting at 9 o'clock Eastern, we will see you then. More coverage picks up right now. Coming on the air, buckled in and screaming toward the general election in November. Now that it is unofficially official that President Biden and former President Trump will go head to head again with Nikki Haley today, bowing out. So what happens next in this new phase of the campaign? And more on why the prospect of a debate matchup is suddenly on the table. Also breaking literally as we speak, we are going to hear a verdict in the Rust trial happening in New Mexico. We're going to tell you what will happen to the movie's armorer charged with manslaughter. We do not have the verdict yet. It's going to be announced, we think, in the next little bit. We're going to tell you as soon as we get it. We'll take you there live. You can see, obviously, some of the images there uh, in Alabama as well, where we are also live because there is a scramble in Montgomery. Lawmakers, in just the last couple of minutes, passing a bill to reopen IVF clinics. The reaction our team's getting from folks on the ground. Plus, we're learning more about the person who died in a dramatic explosion out of Michigan, that fire at a warehouse that was apparently illegally storing gas canisters, what witnesses are saying tonight. Plus, why some far-right figures online have taken on Doritos after a partnership with a transgender influencer. We're going to get into the reasons behind that a little bit later on in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and tonight the longest general election in a generation begins with Donald Trump, now the presumptive Republican nominee, setting up a rematch with President Biden. We haven't had the major candidates locked down this early since MySpace hit a million users back in 2004. That means we're going to tie the record that year, 244 days until the general election. And after 243 of them, you will not be able to avoid the moment the polls show most Americans have been dreading, an election day featuring former President Trump and President Biden, with more than half of voters saying they don't want either as their nominee. Two-thirds say they want somebody new, 67 percent. They're not getting it this time. We're at this point after Nikki Haley today decided her time is up after she won just one state on Super Tuesday. And as she drops out of the race, she's tossing a challenge Mr. Trump's way. Watch. It is now up to Donald Trump to earn the votes of those in our party and beyond it who did not support him. And I hope he does that. At its best, politics is about bringing people into your cause, not turning them away. The former president mocking Haley, even as he invites her supporters to try to get behind his team, a directive, if you will, to fall in line as the last holdouts in his party are doing just that, including Mitch McConnell here. Senate Minority Leader, who summed up his endorsement by um, gushing exuberantly that Mr. Trump has the, I'm quoting here, the requisite support of Republican voters. Okay, maybe not exuberance, but resignation to the reality, perhaps, that this is Donald Trump's party. But on the Democratic side, you've got President Biden hoping he can peel away some of those Haley supporters who feel there's not a place for them in the MAGA movement. 
The big question, of course, where are those voters going to go? Exit polls out of a few key states show that there are Haley voters who are not promising to back Donald Trump. Does that mean they'll go for Joe Biden or will they stay home? We'll get the view from Haley World with Shaq Brewster in a second, but I want to start with Vaughn Hilliard, just steps away from Mar-a-Lago in West Palm Beach, Florida. We showed that post that the former president put up, taking jabs at Nikki Haley, saying she was trounced, even as he said, hey, supporters, come on over my way. Uh, will there be a serious attempt to make that happen? Or is this going to be Donald Trump saying, hey, I'm here, come on in, uh, let's do it, rather than an olive branch? Right, Hallie. I mean, we've been through this here before, and usually it's the power dynamics at play that have led prominent Republicans to come back to Donald Trump. Because if he were to win the presidency, he would all but run the Republican Party. Of course, Nikki Haley was critical eight years ago of Donald Trump when he was running for president the first go around. And a couple months later, she backed his general election campaign and she then became the U.N. ambassador under his administration. So the question is this go around. The stakes are a little bit different. She was actually running her own presidential campaign against him here. And the question is, to what extent does Donald Trump even feel like he needs to appeal to Nikki Haley direct directly? Because the campaign, the Trump campaign, feels that in a Biden-Trump matchup that most of those conservative or even independent voters will fall to Trump, regardless of what Nikki Haley directly has to say. I want to let you listen to part of a conversation that our, uh, our own Garrett Hake, my partner on the Trump beat, had with the co-campaign manager for Trump, Chris Lasavita. Take a listen. People shouldn't expect a big change in tone or strategy from the campaign or the candidate. Why? It's working. What we're currently doing is working. It's working. And for this campaign that's been already on the ground for 17 months, there are some folks that said he's going to have to appeal to a greater swath of the Republican Party. And you could say, tone it down, change his appeal. Donald Trump did the exact opposite. He was indicted four different times. He was found to have engaged repeatedly in financial fraud through the Trump Organization. He was found to have sexually assaulted E. Jean Carroll. And yet he still won handily this Republican nomination, Hallie. Well, you talk about some of the issues that the former president faces. It includes his legal issues, obviously, as we're now learning today, the date that the Supreme Court will hear arguments in that really important presidential immunity case. Circle it, April 25th. The legal calendar and the political calendar merging, especially after you see March 25th, the start of that hush money trial. <laughs> Right. This is where the stakes are actually a little bit different. This is more than an indictment. This is a matter of actually going to trial. Let's just start on March 25th, Hallie. 19 days away, this little, I guess, grace period between all but winning the Republican nomination, becoming the presumptive nominee, and then actually having to show up in a courtroom for anywhere from three, four, five, even six weeks in New York City on, uh, on uh, felony counts is, uh, is rap rapidly approaching. And then fast forward one month later, April 25th, the high stakes oral arguments in front of the U.S. Supreme Court on whether he, uh, when it comes to the federal election interference charges that he faces, stemming from Washington, D.C. indictment, whether he was uh, granted presidential immunity and protected from his official capacity within the White House during that time period. The Supreme Court decision, what we would expect to come several weeks later, would have high stakes on whether those charges and whether that criminal trial actually ever takes place, let alone before the November general election, Hallie. Vaughn Hilliard live for us there in West Palm. Vaughn, thank you. we got to take you out west now where we have breaking news and a live look now inside that courtroom for the Rust trial. Remember, for the movie's armorer, we know that jurors have a verdict in the Rust shooting trial. I'm going to ask my control if this is a live look. I believe that it is. And this is live. This is live. So this is obviously 607 out east. It's a couple hours earlier there in New Mexico. You are looking at Hannah Gutierrez Reed. Again, a live look here in court as she is preparing to hear the verdict in the case 407 there in Santa Fe in the case against her. Prosecutors in closing arguments have told the jury that when Gutierrez Reed wasn't doing her job, filming was like a game of Russian roulette every time an actor had a gun. You see them standing. I want to see if we have audio at all to be able to listen into this verdict. We do not have audio, but we do have a producer in court. Uh, our Dana Griffin, I believe, is in court as well. I hear some of the background noise here. They may have just turned the microphones on. So we're going to listen in here. Now, remember what she faces, right? This is an issue where she is accused. Uh, she, she has loaded the gun that went off in the hand of Alec Baldwin back in October of 2021. That led to the death Are of the movie seen? cinematographer Helena Hutchins. It is now up to the jury to decide 
if she is guilty or not of involuntary manslaughter and tampering with evidence. We do have audio now. Right. I want to listen in as the jury is about just, to just, read out right. its verdict ladies, here in this case. Ladies and gentlemen Let's of listen. the jury, through the four person, have you reached a verdict? Yes. All right, let me see the verdict then. So moments away now from this verdict being read. V remember, this only went to the jury this afternoon. So they have not had the case for that long. We just saw closing arguments presented today from both the, pro both the prosecution and the defense. The defense has tried to make the case, essentially, uh, that Hannah Gutierrez-Reed was not the one who was ultimately right, to blame. So beyond proof of reasonable doubt. Let's listen. I said, ladies and Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, through the four person, have you reached a verdict? Yes. All right, and do you wish to read the verdicts? Sure. Okay, I would start with uh, count one. Count Okay, you both of them. Will the defendant please stand? Find the defendant, Hannah Gutierrez, guilty of involuntary manslaughter as charged in count one. We find the defendant, Hannah Gutierrez, not guilty of tampering with evidence as charged in count two. All right, thank you. You may be seated. Let me get those forms, retrieve those forms from you. I'm going to do what's called polling the jury. What I need to put on the record is that this is your individual verdict, okay? So I'm going to start with the gentleman in the back. Is this your uh, verdict? Yes. Ma'am, is this your verdict? Hannah Gutierrez-Reed there, the armorer on the set of the movie Rust, the day that Helena Hutchins was killed by a gun going off on set, found guilty of involuntary manslaughter, not guilty of tampering with evidence. And you saw her there, no reaction, very little reaction as those counts were read. I want to bring in our NBC News legal analyst, Danny Savalos, who is joining us as well. Uh, and here we have Hannah Gutierrez-Reed in her late 20s after two weeks now of this trial. Alec Baldwin will go to trial later on this year. Remember, this is separate now from the case on Baldwin. As we keep an eye, Danny, on this live look inside court, can you first explain the difference in these charges here? Why would a jury find her guilty of one charge but not the other? Help us understand that. Uh, so far, that's the one that mystifies me the most and approves mm. the old adage that you simply can never guess at what a jury is going to do. If anything, I would have said the tampering with evidence might have been the slam dunk uh, and the uh, involuntary manslaughter charge, what might have been an acquittal, although... Uh, this was the stronger of the two cases that the state had. After all, the case that they had was that Hannah Gutierrez-Reed was somebody with responsibility for firearm safety on set. Now, she shared that with other people, and they, the defense made a case that she was overworked and made to do two jobs. And I rather think the state, when they made their initial promise that they would prove where the live rounds came from, it seemed to me most of their proof was, well, where else could they have come from but Hannah gutierrez Reed? But it appears uh, that the jury has uh, believed the state's evidence to beyond a reasonable doubt. And the way I saw this case is that either an acquittal or a conviction is good news for Alec Baldwin for several reasons. So Number explain one, that piece of no it. matter what. Yeah, no matter what, Alec Baldwin's team gets a first look at the evidence. This was one of several missteps by the state trying these two defendants separately. Uh, so now Alec Baldwin's seen pretty much what the state's case is. And frankly, I think the, if you're Alec Baldwin's team, you take the state's case against Hannah Gutierrez-Reed, and that's your defense case. It's pointing the finger at somebody else who is responsible. Mm. They will put Hannah Gutierrez-Reed on trial, the defense for Alec Baldwin, and now they've had the benefit of the state doing that job for them uh, just before Alec Baldwin's trial. Now, uh, with a conviction, I think that's good for Baldwin because he can voice the blame on her. And an acquittal would also be good for Baldwin because it shows uh, that the state's case isn't strong and it's their strongest case, that one against the armor.
she would face, I believe, up to 18 months behind bars if, in fact, the judge follows the sentencing guidelines, ultimately, which will happen down the road. Um, Danny, is this appealable? In other words, is she expected, is her team expected to appeal, potentially? Yes, every conviction is appealed as of right to the Intermediate Court of Appeals. Now, the rules are slightly different from state to state and the federal system, but in terms of time to do it, but that is the rule. You get an automatic appeal to the Intermediate Court of Appeals. Appeals beyond that are discretionary, and there will be appeal. This case will be appealed. There's no doubt about it. And they may have uh, some legal issues on appeal, but it's it's always a hollow uh, promise that uh, the appeal will come because statistically your odds are just so slim on appeal. And, uh, you know, in, in any case, whether it's a, a, a high risk case, like I think this is, or just your run of the mill case that you've never heard of, uh, an appeal after conviction really isn't much, uh, uh, much of a, uh, an assurance if your client's going to be spending that time yeah. incarcerated. So then what happens now? We just saw that shot, and obviously there's some emotion in court. It's not clear uh, who the folks are sitting in the back right now. We'll get to our producer and our correspondent, Dana Griffin, who are in court later on once they leave the room. Does she immediately get remanded to custody here, Danny? Is that why? Is that what's happening? Well, typically, whether or not a defendant gets remanded immediately after a conviction is really not related to what their sentence will be. It, you do look at the gravity of the crime. Usually that's a function of has she been out uh, prior to the verdict and has she done well on pretrial release, then often you can you can remain out. However, sometimes the DA will ask for remand after a conviction uh, in a case where, for example, you have an involuntary manslaughter. Uh, and so... The interesting thing here is that the remand itself is not necessarily related Got to it. her sentencing, okay. uh, but the sentencing will likely not happen for some time. They have to put together a sentencing memorandum and a pre-sentence investigation report. You saw Gutierrez read. It looked like comforted there briefly as she is now exiting the courtroom. And Danny, as you mentioned, we are now looking ahead, of course, to the trial of Alec Baldwin, which is supposed to start in July. Lots of developments, lots of breaking news on that front. Thank you very much for walking us through it here in rolling coverage right here on NBC News Now. Thanks, Danny. Let's bring you back here to Washington now because we're looking ahead to another big moment in politics, not just the start of the general election, but President Biden getting ready to make what's basically a response, a rebuttal to Mr. Trump's Super Tuesday near sweep at the State of the Union tomorrow night. This is a major platform for him. I want you to look at this graphic here. These are the top 100 most viewed broadcasts, most viewed events of last year. Look at all those footballs. Sports, pro sports, college sports, there are a couple of exceptions. The Oscars, that's the little Oscar statue. The Thanksgiving Day Parade, that's your little turkey. And the American flag, that's the State of the Union. A lot of people watch. It is still a moment for big eyeballs for President Biden. And our White House team reports that the president knows that. His message, set to boil down to one big question. Whose side are you on? Expect to hear a lot about the cost of drugs, about immigration and the border, and the Israel-Hamas war. All of it, part of what the campaign, the president, the White House sees is not a one night primetime event, but a lead up to a full on flood the zone moment for his message. Kelly O'Donnell is outside the White House for us tonight. And Kelly, let's pick up on one of those topics, which is, which is the Israel Hamas war. The president has faced some opposition to his handling of that war, even inside his own party. We saw that, for example, with that uncommitted protest push in Michigan to a lesser degree in Minnesota. It is entirely possible that if there is any reaction from the chamber tomorrow night, it may not just come from the right, but possibly even his left, Kel. It is possible, and certainly the White House and the president's team are preparing for that. Lawmakers are able to invite guests who appear in the gallery, sit in the gallery. They're typically not seen on camera when you watch the address, but they are there. Each lawmaker gets to invite one person. We certainly see when the, the first lady has guests and so forth, so you get a sense of that. But it is possible that there will be those who will voice their concerns uh, on the left, on the right for different reasons. And so part of what the White House has done in the president's preparation is to try and think through ways that he can respond to that in real time. They believe that last year, when there was some calling out from lawmakers about issues, uh, that he was able to react, show some agility, show that he was in command of the room, and that worked well for the president in the eyes of his advisors and his team. So they are preparing for that potential, knowing that in just one year, the world has changed so dramatically 
with the state of what's happening in Gaza, the ongoing concerns about Ukraine, and all the other things uh, that make a State of the Union night so memorable and such a big opportunity for the president. And then there's also this piece of it, right? We know that on the political path, Mr. Trump has a clearer path now that Nikki Haley is out. There's also, and he, he was not a major force in the Democratic primary, but he existed, Congressman Dean Phillips, on the Democratic side, dropping out of the race against President Biden. We're just learning that there was a phone call, I guess, between the president and the congressman. President Biden called him. Called him, and this is the kind of thing you would typically see, and it's about trying to, it's a different approach than former President Trump is taking with Nikki Haley dropping out of the race. But although Dean Phillips was not a big presence, he was part of that voice of uh, criticism within the party that certainly is a concern for the Biden campaign. They want to get their team in all its disparate parts to be rowing in the same direction. So there was a phone call between the president and Dean Phillips, an outreach to say, join us, we want you to work with us. And that is uh, certainly something in a state, his home state of Minnesota is one of those sort of big Midwest battlegrounds that will be important. And so President Biden, whether it's Nikki Haley today, where he praised her bravery and courage running in the Republican primary, and also spoke to her supporters saying, come over, be open to potentially voting for him, even though he's a Democrat and not naturally uh, the, the base of uh, a Nikki Haley voter, but doing that as well as outreach to Dean Phillips uh, to take a different approach of saying he's trying to build a coalition to win for a second time. Hallie? Kelly O'Donnell, thank you so much for that. Uh, we appreciate it. We will see you and the rest of your team tomorrow night with special coverage of State of the Union right here on NBC News Now starting at 8 o'clock Eastern. We've got some other developing news for you tonight, because in just the last hour, actually in just the last couple of minutes, we've seen action out of Alabama, where the state house voted to approve a bill to protect IVF clinics from lawsuits, a bill that is likely to get to the governor's desk possibly tonight. He may sign it into law as early as tomorrow morning. You're looking at live pictures now from the state Senate, where she, excuse me, Governor Kay Ivey, of course, uh, has said she will, in fact, sign this if it gets to her. Lawmakers have been debating this after that controversial Alabama State Supreme Court ruling that said frozen embryos should be considered children, should have the same rights as children. But some lawyers have said the way that this bill is crafted just doesn't do enough. Dasha Burns is joining us now from Montgomery, Alabama. Okay, so Dasha, this is a process that we have been anticipating. We covered it here on this show last week when this first came into the ether. It is moving quickly now. We are basically in like yeah. sort of the, the final um, like pro forma finish, right? Because it's expected it's going to get through yeah. the House, get through the Senate, get to the governor's desk. Uh, and then what, right? Do IVF clinics then restart procedures right away? Do these families who have been in limbo waiting for news on their in vitro procedures get some clarity? Yeah, so we were just in the House chamber, Hallie, and some of the questions that were being asked as this was debated on the floor were really focused on, does this give confidence to clinics providing IVF treatment to reopen and restart those procedures? And the answer from the, the folks who have been crafting this was yes. They said that they've talked to doctors, they've talked to these facilities, they've also talked to uh, the numerous entities that provide the tools and resources in order to transport embryos for example, in all parts of the process, that they feel confident they can now continue. Uh, so this is a bill uh, that will soon become law, potentially as, as soon as tonight, that will grant blanket immunity to basically all of those involved in the IVF process. Here is what one of the fertility doctors I, I talked to told me about what this means. We have women who have been waiting for this uh, bill to pass and, in fact, anticipating embryo transfers as soon as tomorrow or Friday. We know that there are larger questions surrounding the Supreme Court ruling um, and some uncertainties about whether the Supreme Court will accept this um, bill as, as a part of our law. There is a but here, Hallie, because one of the lawmakers I talked to essentially called this a Band-Aid on a hemorrhaging wound. This is a mm. stopgap measure that will ensure that families can restart this process, but it does not touch the fundamental issue that came out of this ruling, which is that embryos should be treated as children. That was actually based on a 2018 amendment to the Alabama state constitution that says embryos are people, and that is at 
the heart of this issue. That has not been touched here. And so there are lawyers, lawmakers, uh, a lot of folks that have been questioning for the long term whether this still leaves open the door to liability and a whole other can of worms that can uh, potentially harm families that can make this uh, process more more difficult, Hallie. Dasha Burns, live first there in Montgomery. Uh, lots to untangle, lots to talk through. Dasha, thanks so much for keeping an eye on all of it. Appreciate it. To some other developing news tonight out of the Middle East, where we're just learning that another sailor who was on a commercial ship is dead, bringing the total killed now to three after an attack by Houthi rebels near Yemen. Look at this photo. This is something provided by the U.S. military. It shows the aftermath there. Do you see it? The, the damage, what looks like smoke billowing off that ship? This marks the first time that anybody has been killed in the Houthi attacks since they started targeting ships in the Red Sea at the start of the Israel-Hamas war. It happened on a Liberian-owned ship flying the Barbados flag, raising the possibility that American troops could respond with yet another round of strikes on the rebels. NBC's Courtney Kuby is following this for us. And Courtney, here we have yet another uh, very difficult update tonight. Uh, another person, another sailor killed here. Talk us through it and what the U.S. response could be. Yeah, another civilian mariner. And Hallie, we also learned just moments ago that, in fact, several of those injured civilian mariners are in critical condition. So a very serious strike here. And you can see, I mean, when you look at the pictures of that ship, it's an enormous ship. So think about how you can see the smoke billowing out of the end of it there, uh, just to give you a sense of the, the scale of the destruction that this Houthi anti-ship ballistic missile did to this enormous cargo ship. Now, this happened earlier today about 60 miles off the coast of Aden in Yemen, when uh, a missile was fired from the Houthi-controlled part of Yemen at this ship. And Halley, the Houthis have been particularly active just in the past couple of days, firing five anti-ship ballistic missiles at ships. They struck this one here today. They actually struck another ship. Another missile was shot down by the USS Carnia, a U.S. military ship in the area. But two others landed, fortunately, just in the water, not impacting anything. But their activity has been up significantly. Now, you mentioned the possibility of a response. Defense officials say tonight they are looking at possible responses. What we have seen recently in other Houthi attacks, when they've been success successfully attacked ships, we've seen the U.S. and British military come together to conduct strikes. But the reality is, Hallie, they do not seem to be deterring the Houthis from continuing these attacks. Courtney QB, there's a lot of moving pieces tonight at the Pentagon. Thank you very much for bringing them to us here on the show. Coming up, more to get to. Call it a political power play. How Elon Musk, the multi-billionaire, could still have a big influence in the race for the White House, even if he doesn't put his cash behind either candidate, as he's now saying. More on that in just a sec. Tonight, officials are sharing more about the victim of that huge fire in Michigan, the one you're seeing here. Look at that, the explosions coming out of that plant, literally shaking houses nearby, raining down debris Monday. Police describe it as a vape distribution facility that had been illegally storing combustible gas canisters, one of which apparently hit 19-year-old Turner Salter, eventually killing him. Officials say Salter was at a car wash nearby, maybe watching all the commotion as it happened. Now, crews were at the scene cleaning up as officials warned some of the debris scattered around could still be dangerous, could still be potentially explosive. The big tr question they're trying to answer, what came first, the fire or the explosion? Adrian Bratis is joining us now. We've shown the pictures, and you can't overstate it, how dramatic this was. Some of these explosive canisters went flying something like a mile. It is still dangerous near this site. Talk to us about what happened and where the investigation goes now. Hallie, the latest information is up to two miles away. That's how far the debris was scattered. And the warning for residents here is if you see one of those canisters, don't touch it, don't pick it up, because it could still explode. We have seen small fires reemerging here throughout the day. Investigators are hoping that they can get on this site fully so they can start the next step to pinpoint what happened, what led to that series of explosions. You talked about those flying canisters and the flying debris. That is what hit the 19-year-old Turner in his head. His funeral is planned for this Friday. He will be remembered as a teen who was kind and served in his church. Meanwhile, people back here in the community are still talking about what they saw. What I felt was the whole world, the earth shaking. It was, uh, it was, it was, pr it was pretty bad and scary. Um, it never stopped. It never stopped. The explosions never 
stopped. And what was exploding, Hallie, those canisters which contained butane, at least half remained after the business owners here had just received recently a shipment, a semi-load. Also inside of a back room, according to city officials, was a pallet of nitrous oxide along with lighter fluid. And authorities telling us this, well, it's gone now, but the building that was here before was supposed to be a retail operation. Allie. Adrian brought us live for us there in Michigan. Thank you. To Elon Musk now putting to bed questions about who he's supporting in the 2024 election. And at least when it comes to dollars, it seems like the answer is nobody. In a post just today on X, Musk wrote, to be super clear, I'm not donating money to either candidate for U.S. president. And look, he kind of had to come out and say this after he was spotted at Mar-a-Lago this past weekend, meeting with Mr. Trump and a few Republican donors, according to The New York Times. The whole thing raising a bunch of questions about whether Musk was putting his support or maybe some of his nearly $200 billion net worth behind former President Trump, who's looking for some cash. NBC News business and data correspondent Brian Chung is joining us now with more. So even if Musk doesn't make any direct donations, and by the way, the language is interesting in his, in his ex post. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Like, there's also a lot of things that aren't campaigns you can donate money to. You know what I mean? That would, that would make it different here. Still, he's got a lot of ways, if he wanted to, to put his finger on the scale come November. Yeah, well, and it's significant because he's one of the wealthiest people in the world. But yeah, I mean, if he says he's not going to commit money, there are certainly other ways that he could put his thumb on the scale. And that's because of his massive influence, right? He owns the X, formerly known as Twitter platform. He's got 175 million followers on there. And then even outside of the public facing aspect of what Musk does and says, it's also behind the scenes, right? He has many connections to other very wealthy people. And again, this is just one example, but we know that he has a relationship with Kanye West, who also has a lot of money. So money could go into the Trump campaign as a result of his connections, even if it doesn't come from Musk directly. But also, again, he's been tweeting very clearly. It's not a surprise to anyone that he supports uh, this, this candidate over uh, Biden. And for that reason, he can continue to say things, in some cases also lob perhaps misinformation about hmm. certain situations, as he's done before, to perhaps uh, put his thumb on the scale, Hallie. A recent NBC News investigation found that Musk is wrapped up in at least 11 different regulatory battles with the government. He is, in some ways, Brian, unique uniquely invested in who ends up in the White House. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, he runs many, many businesses. A lot of them have been wrapped up in regulatory issues, which he has been, uh, Musk rather, has been very clear in saying holds him back. So he might be in favor of a candidate that is going to pair some of those regulations back as uh, Trump did during 2016. But I also want to point out that Musk isn't necessarily on board entirely with all the policies. We remember that deal book uh, conference that he appeared at earlier this year where he didn't necessarily go full throated behind Trump. Take a listen. Could you see yourself voting for President Biden if, if, it's, if it's a Biden-Trump election, for example? I think I would not vote for Biden. <laughs> You'd vote for Trump. I'm not saying I'd vote for Trump, but I mean, this is, this is definitely a difficult choice here. So a difficult choice here. I mean, look, we've known based off of what he said since then that he would support Trump over Biden. But you have to see that. I mean, that long pause was a long pause. Right. So when it comes to the other types of policies, that certainly does enter the fold here. But on a regulatory basis, certainly he would probably prefer uh, the former president to uh, to Biden. 30,000 foot view here, though. X could be incredibly powerful come November uh, in ways that are perhaps useful to candidates and to campaigns and in ways that are perhaps dangerous when it comes to something you alluded to, which is misinformation. Yeah, and we have to remember that he has used this platform for political reasons before when he tried to launch the Ron DeSantis campaign. Remember, that didn't go well at all. There were technical issues behind the scenes. But, you know, even if Musk isn't throwing money behind the scenes, we have to remember that this platform has had a lot of big changes since he took it private not long ago. And there are concerns about whether or not even if he himself is going to, uh, you know, use it to say whatever he wants to say, that whether or not he's going to police the other types of misinformation that could come for the other millions of users that are on the platform. So, Here's the stance when it comes to X's policy on specifically voting and civic engagement. So it says, quote, you may not use X's services for the purposes of manipulating or interfering in elections or other civic processes. I'm paraphrasing here, but that includes a suppressing participation, misleading people about how and where to vote or inciting violence during an election. So these are all things that are codified in the policy, but enforcing it, Hallie, 
is a whole separate question. It's a private company. There are no shareholders yeah. to answer to. That's very much an opaque process for uh, this massive social media company. Yeah, Musk is really uh, in the driver's seat on that one to a big yeah. degree. Brian Chung, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, police say eight students were shot today near a SEPTA bus in Philly. One of them shot multiple times, now in critical condition. Officials say the teens were waiting for the bus when three people got out of a car and started firing. Police have said they're working to make sure that somebody's held responsible here. Number two, federal prosecutors charging a man in Texas with trying to scam this guy. You recognize him? Former Congressman George Santos and three other people, an actor, a musician, and an athlete. The FBI says he told these people that this person could help get criminal charges dropped, but says that the suspect admitted in an interview he needed money back to pay gambling debts. Santos's attorney not immediately responding to a request for comment. Number three, Paralympics officials today saying athletes from Russia and Belarus will not get to march in the opening ceremony in Paris this summer. That's even stricter than the Olympics, which is going to let them join that opening ceremony as long as they're competing as neutral athletes. So meaning like no country flag or name or song or anything because of the war of Ukraine. Number four, Doritos says it's cutting ties with a transgender influencer it partnered with in Spain, Samantha Hudson. That sparked a big boycott Doritos campaign in right wing circles online. In a statement to NBC News, Doritos parent company PepsiCo says it didn't cut ties because of the boycott, but because of controversial tweets that Hudson had made, controversial posts, adding, we strongly condemn words or actions that promote violence or sexism of any kind. Number five, a new study says ancient stone tools found in Ukraine are more than a million years old, may be, according to archaeologists, the earliest evidence of humans in Europe. They think that these stones might have been used as like very primitive knives to cut meat. Hmm. Coming up, the new warning from the State Department, why the U.S. is telling Americans to get out of Haiti ASAP. Plus, why protesters drove a pickup truck into the National Palace in Mexico City. The latest from the president, look at that, coming up in just a sec. NBC News covers hundreds of international stories every day, and because it can be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our teams around the world have done it for you. Here's a look at what they're watching in a segment we call The Global. Out of Mexico, look at this video. That's a pickup truck ramming into the doors of the National Palace in Mexico City today. It's where the president lives. It's where he holds his daily press briefings. The group smashed the door. Several of them ended up inside. They said they were demanding answers from more than 40 students who went missing a decade ago. There have been growing calls to investigate an alleged cover-up. Mexico's president responding, saying the plan is to create a provocation. Out of the Vatican, Pope Francis having a tough time climbing the steps back onto his Pope mobile today. His aides had to use the Pope's wheelchair to end up moving him out of the piazza. He's 87, remember, and as you know, if you've been watching the show, we've talked about how he's been dealing with the flu, some other lingering health issues. The Pope also had an aide read his remarks, which he's done for the past few days. And out of Germany, a new study out on a man who got a, co who got a COVID shot. So he got his COVID vaccine. He got it 200 plus times. He, he got them all. He's 62 in like two and a half years since the pandemic. And guess what? After all those shots, literally multiple hundreds of shots, no negative health effects, according to researchers. And his immune response didn't get any better or worse. A prosecutor had opened an investigation into the man for giving out vaccination cards and for fraud, but no charges were ever filed. To be clear, Researchers say they do not endorse this so-called hyper-vaccination to try to improve immunity. So, in other words, don't try that at home. The State Department tonight saying in just the last half hour that Americans should get out of Haiti as soon as possible because of how dangerous it's getting there. That's as the U.S. government urges the Haitian prime minister to speed up his own resignation and a political transition to democratic elections as the country gets close to the brink of civil war, according to one U.S. official and a source familiar with the conversations. The State Department saying a few hours ago, they're not pushing. Listen to the words. We are not calling on him or pushing for him to resign, but we are urging him to expedite the transition to an empowered and inclusive governance structure that will move with urgency to help the country prepare for a multinational security support mission to address the security situation and pave the way for free and fair elections. Now, the administration is tiptoeing carefully here as Haiti's security crisis really gets to a breaking point. Prime Minister now on American soil in Puerto Rico. He's not able to fly back because the airport in Haiti is being targeted by assaults. Gabe Gutierrez is joining us now. Because the U.S. is in the middle, Gabe, of this very, um, very delicate power struggle here. And I think you heard it a little bit when we played it from the State Department. 
words matter in diplomacy, and in this instance, words definitely matter. Yeah, that's right, Hallie, and we just heard from Corinne Jean-Pierre a short time ago echoing what the State Department said, essentially that they are not pressuring uh, the Prime Minister to resign. They just want him to leave a little faster. So, yes, they are choosing their words very, very carefully here. Here's some of what Corinne Jean-Pierre, the White House Press Secretary, had to say. We are definitely not pushing prime, the Prime Minister to resign. That is not what we're doing. But we have underscored that now is the time to finalize a political accord to help set Haiti on a path to a better future. And that is something that we've been working on for some time. So, yeah, Hallie, the White House walking that very fine line. And as you said, this all comes as Prime Minister, um, the, the Prime Minister is now in Puerto Rico. The White House also saying that they are not helping the Prime Minister at this point. So unclear when he plans to return uh, to Haiti. Uh, Ariel Henry uh, came to power uh, back in 2021 following the assassination of the country's president. So this is the definite escalation, as you've reported, that over the weekend there was that prison break in that country, and this uh, Haiti is sliding further and further into chaos at this point, Hallie. Well, let's talk about that chaos, because we've talked about the issues with that airport getting targeted. It's an airport that I think it's the same one that you visited, Gabe, when you went to Haiti not too long ago. I think it was in the, within the last couple of years. The concern is, right, timing. If this security situation keeps getting worse, right, Right? If, if these attacks keep on happening, um, the scope of what the White House, what the U.S. can do gets more and more narrow. Yeah, exactly. The options are, are limited here. Look, the U.S. has in some way, shape or another been involved with Haiti for a very long time. You know, even in the 90s, following Jean uh, the military coup, Jean Bertrand Aristide and the U.S. having to get involved there with a multinational force. And so now the question becomes, what options does the U.S. have? The, US, the White House has been very insistent that they will not send American boots on the ground to Haiti. But now this multi multinational security force force led by Kenya. When will that, uh, you know, take effect? And what options does the U.S. have if the prime minister does not want uh, to, you know, get out of power? So, yes, a lot of questions remaining at this point, Hallie. But the, but the, the major question right now for the U.S., how much does it plan to get involved? And, you know, when, when will these uh, gangs, these armed gangs in Haiti that now control about 70, uh, about 80 percent, actually, of Port-au-Prince, will they accept anything than the full resignation of the prime yeah. minister? Allie. Gabe Gutierrez, thank you so much for breaking that one down for us. Appreciate it. Coming up, a plan that could change the future of flying. How travelers are responding to a self-checkout style TSA checkpoint. So today, TSA is rolling out something that could change the future of checkpoints at the airport, a six-month plan that's kind of like self-checkout at the grocery store. It's only in Vegas for now, and it is only for people with pre-check for now, since, you know, we know the routine. NBC's Tom Costello knows the routine. He tried it for himself. Take a look. Just come up to the checkpoint, take your carry-on, put it in the bin. If you've got any questions, simply ask the TSA officer on demand. Hi there, how may I help you today? Slide your bin onto the rollers, then walk right into the full body scanner. Put your arms down to the side, and it's going to look for anything that shouldn't be there. And it's telling me I got to come back out. I have a microphone, of course, that it's detected. I've got the transmitter on my belt, and something a lot of people forget my cell phone look at you what an active stand-up yeah. like you're doing it you're showing and telling because <laughs> what comes up for me is like you know you're at the grocery store doing self-checkout not you know 50 50 shot you don't make it through easily something goes wrong you gotta hit the little button the person says like is this actually gonna be helpful or like it, I'm a little skeptical. So, yes, and that's exactly what the TSA is trying to model from your okay. checkpoint experience, checkout experience at the local grocery store, whatever you use. Do you remember how to scan your bananas? I'm, I can I never remember the, the code. code. Exactly. The number, then it says error, then I can exactly. put it in the bag. And then I mean, there's your like, apples, you know, your shampoo, right. your chicken, like, whatever. Come on. Now, for those people who have it down pat, yes. the thinking is the same thing might be true in a TSA checkpoint. Hmm. If you are a pre check, 
you have to be pre-checked. Frequent flyer. And if you fly all the time and you know how to make this move, this may be something for you. You may be able to make this work. I asked the TSA chief, David Pekoski, Admiral David Pekoski, is this something that can roll out nationwide? Maybe not so fast. Mm -hmm. Here's what he said. Don't expect this to be widely rolled out at every airport and every checkpoint. No, I don't think so. And, and really, we're very early in the, in the process. I mean, you know, part of what we're trying to do here is to figure out, hey, what works? What facilitates movement of people? Uh, while at the same time, making sure that we can provide the security we provide. Two and a half million people, of course, are going through TSA checkpoints every day. And I got a little headline for you. If you are going on spring break, be warned. TSA says it's going to be even bigger than last year, which was a Oof. record. We're already seeing passenger volumes up 6% over last year. You know what they say, Tom? Pack your patience. Have you Ooh. heard that one before? I don't know if you heard that. I'm the, I got a, a trademark that's underneath that. original right there. Well, so here's <laughs> the question, though, right? Because obviously the, the reason for TSA, the reason we go through these checkpoints, is not to annoy all of us and slow us down. It's for security. It's to keep us safe on the plane, right? So how do they navigate yeah. that? And do, do they think that this can actually create, because we always see those images every year of, like, all the crazy things people leave at checkpoints that are confiscated. That's right. S safety versus speed. How are they navigating that? Listen, let's also underscore that it was stood up after 9-11 yes. and the tragedy of 9-11, and uh, they are still confiscating record numbers of guns every year at checkpoints. So that's the big question, right? Can this still achieve expedition? Can you move people through, but at the same time, can you have a secure checkpoint? Uh, there's also this going on here, I would tell you, and that is this concern about where we are in a competitiveness in terms of other countries and how well they screen passengers. Because the truth is, the U.S. Travel Association says we're number 17. Wow. Ranking number 17 in terms of our competitiveness. What do they base that on? Okay, among other things, how good is the airport? Are they kind of crumbling? Is that for all the airports broadly? Like that's an yeah. average of airports? Nationwide. Okay. okay. So, and you could see some of the other countries who had higher scores. Yeah. So, like, Reagan's pulling up that average. Maybe there's another airport pulling it down, you know. All right, did you like it? That was a little editorial on your did part. You, that's fair. That's fine. Did travelers like it? Did people uh, talk I gotta to say, you? I think it's glitchy. Uh, I think it's a little right. glitchy. I think it may be too much to ask of Tom's passengers take. right now. Okay. All right. Well, we'll see. And I don't even, if you can't remember your banana code, <laughs> but if, it, no. if it's tested in Vegas, will it stay in Vegas? We'll see. Look at you with the turn of phrase, Tom Costello. Thank you. Appreciate right. you. Super interesting. Still to come, the new push by some tech companies to bring nuclear power back. What that has to do with the future of AI next in tonight's original. To tonight's original now with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been watching. And tonight we're talking about nuclear power and AI. With those two words together for a lot of people, maybe feeling a little bit scared, right? Nukes and artificial intelligence. For others, it may bring back frightening memories of disasters like Chernobyl or Three Mile Island when we talk about nuclear plants. But a new generation of entrepreneurs out of Silicon Valley wants to build newer, safer plants that could power the future of AI. Here's Jake Ward. This remote site in eastern Idaho could soon be the birthplace of a new nuclear age. The reprocessing and refabrication of highly radioactive fuel. The Idaho National Lab is a research facility where, in the 1970s and 80s, the U.S. government experimented with a safer kind of nuclear reactor. The federal government put their early research reactors out here because it's full of underground water and, frankly, there's no one out here. Decades after the plant stopped running, a Silicon Valley-backed company wants to build a new version, a 15-megawatt reactor called Aurora. We'll be installing a fuel fabrication line in here and making fuel for our, for our plant. The reactor will use liquid metal as coolant and leftover nuclear waste from the government as fuel. So this is the place where they will recover the fuel that you need? Yeah, and then we'll fabricate it. The company's CEO has been working in nuclear since he was 16 and envisions his reactor powering a town or a factory. For most of my life, there's not been a question about the demand for what nuclear energy is, which is reliable, clean, affordable. I mean, those are all attributes people want. And big tech wants it, too. Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates, and a host of VC firms have invested in several nuclear companies. There's a, a long history of humans and machines working together. OpenAI CEO Sam Altman is chairman of Oklo's board and speaks openly about requiring huge amounts of power for the data centers that make AI possible. This is like a desperate need for as much energy as we can manufacture. But this is not an unregulated technology like AI. This is nuclear, where the waste from even new reactor designs like Oklo's will remain dangerously radioactive for centuries. 
In 2022, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission told Oakland they had not provided enough safety information. DeWitt says the company is working to satisfy regulators. You've got new physics, you have to use new models, you have to do all sorts of stuff that's different than what they're used to. A lot of things that they're used to don't apply, but they have to do their independent job of ensuring this meets adequate safety requirements. In nearby Idaho Falls, folks seem pretty comfortable with the idea. I think it's great. We've had it before. Right. So at this point, you'd say you're pretty comfortable with nuclear power. Oh, yeah. 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 A growing number of Americans feel the same. But critics argue that nuclear solves a problem for tech CEOs, not for humanity. If you were to integrate large language models, GPT-style models into search engines, it's going to cost, you know, five times as much environmentally as standard search. I want to see innovation in this country. I just want the scope of innovation to be determined beyond, you know, the incentive structures of this these giant companies. Couldn't we just cut back on our energy consumption? Why do we need more to feed our society more and more and more power? Yeah, I'm going to answer that in two ways. We've almost always seen a direct correlation between energy abundance, in other words, high energy footprints, and pretty much all, qual all aspects of quality of life. Not to mention, we're also trying to decarbonize. We are still so far away from electrifying vehicles, and the amount of energy we're going to need to do that is huge. Now, Hallie, on the one hand, the question here is just logistical, right? I mean, if we're going to electrify everything from cars to kitchen ranges, we're going to need vastly more power than we can currently produce. But this also raises a philosophical question, right? I mean, whose interests are we serving by going to nuclear? Are we just serving the interests of companies that want to build AI products and EVs and figure out ways to power them? Or are we actually serving humanity's interests? I mean, are we, are we trying to live with more power or should we be trying to live with less? Hallie? It's these difficult uh, and really intense questions. Our thanks to our, our good friend Jake Ward for all of that amazing reporting. That does it for this hour. A reminder, we're going to have special coverage of the State of the Union tomorrow night right here on NBC News Now. You can find it however you're watching. I'll be rejoined by my friend Tom Yamas here in D.C. at 8 o'clock Eastern. And then on NBC News starting at 9 o'clock Eastern. We will see you then. More coverage picks up right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.